in case anyone thought for a minute that these conversations were in any way choreographed, pre-cooked, <laughs> pre-discussed, we have never met before. We have never spoken. I didn't know who the hell you were. I think this is a very nice little banquette. The bottle service will begin shortly. But I thought just, just because we, we haven't met, maybe we just begin by cuddling for a couple of minutes. Is that all right with you? So welcome, Jeff. It's good to have you here. And it's good to be with all of you. We'll skip the cuddling for now. But why don't you begin by way of introduction uh, in, t in telling the audience what the hell it is you do and what the restorative technologies group is. So restorative, restorative therapies, therapies group. That's pretty good. That was close enough. So um, yes, I've been uh, with uh, Medtronic now for eight years, and I was at uh, GE uh, for 20 years before that. So um, you know, my career has been in partly financial services. I was in the commercial GE Capital, and then uh, the, the rest uh, health. What the hell happened to GE? <laughs> we only have 18 minutes here. 18 minutes here. Um, but, uh, well, you, okay, so anyway, uh, but at Medtronic, I, I've, I've, I'm responsible now for this restorative therapies group, which is basically the neurosciences, um, you know, the neurosciences part of, of Medtronic, which is very exciting. This is dealing with uh, therapies that deal with the central nervous system. Uh, so we have businesses uh, that do like a stroke. Um, deep brain stimulation. By the way, we could use some marketing people here because the restorative therapies group doesn't really describe, you know, it should be more neuroscience brain. It's not the cool enough name. And I don't know who named deep brain stimulation, but it's not exactly appealing to consumers. Uh, but it is a very, uh, it's a great therapy uh, that uh, deals with uh, movement disorders, things like Parkinson's. Uh, we have a ear, nose, and throat business. We do um, uh, neuromodulation, uh, well, for, for pain, so spinal cord stimulation to, re, re, uh, to relieve uh, chronic pain. We're the leader in uh, spine surgery as well, uh, and, and, and the list goes I'm on. I'm familiar with your spine surgery uh, devices, and they really change lives. Yep. I mean, people absolutely, and right. uh, not to mention the other things that you're that Medtronic is famous for. What are the big innovations that you see in your industry, in your area, that you've got your eye on, that you may be at the forefront of, sure. or that you're watching very closely for uh, future adoption? Well, a, a couple of themes. One would be robotics, um, surgical robotics. Um, and in Medtronic overall, we've got a number of plays in this area. Uh, we're introducing a, um, a general surgery robot to compete with the Da Vinci robot that the Intuitive has. In my area, we have a spine robot that's out there. We're introducing a cranial robot. And when you think about robotics, it's, it's, it's really more than just the kind of the robotic arm that you, know, you see in the pictures. It's really the integration of surgical planning tools, uh, interoperative imaging, uh, navigation, of course, the robotic assistance and many other like tools, like drills and things like that, they're all incorporated into the robot and it's, it's allowing for, I, I think it's gonna change uh, surgery, really. And like you mentioned, spine surgery, uh, you know, I'm glad you feel that it, it impacts people's lives in a positive way, but, but the reality of it is the surgical outcomes are too variable. You know, there's some that change people's lives in a very positive ways and sometimes it doesn't work quite as well. And I, I really believe that uh, robotics is gonna change that, not just the surgical assistance during the procedure that'll be more precise, uh, but the planning tools uh, that come and, and that can actually um, you know, help the surgeon really stick to the plan during the procedure and also predict what, how that procedure will, will result and, and, and maybe change their plan uh, through that. So I, I think it's kind of a big impact. In other areas, miniaturization of electronics and uh, advancement in batteries, that's, a, that's disrupting the implantable space. So implantables like pacemakers, pacemakers defibrillators, uh, defibrillators right. and in our case, neuromodulation devices, which are like a pacemaker that connects to your brain for, to uh, send electric pulses, to modulate like Parkinson's symptoms, uh, or to your spinal cord to alleviate back pain and leg pain. Or one thing that you know, people in our society don't like to talk about too, your, your sacral nerve uh, to uh, relieve overactive bladder. And this is a real problem, for, mainly for women whose pelvic floor breaks down. It's a debilitating condition. And, and so anyway, the, the advancements here are really, we're shrinking these devices uh, you know, we've got devices that are le less than one cc, like so a, pa a pacemaker, our mm -hmm. latest pacemaker called Micra, doesn't even have leads. It's introduced through your femoral artery with a catheter all the way into the ventricles of your heart. We deploy it in the heart, no pacemaker, I mean no uh, leads or no wires, and it attaches to the, to the, uh, the, the lining of your, of your heart. 
and it uh, modulates you know, your, your heart for the battery life on this thing is like 12 years. Uh, we have like a greater than 99% deployment rate and it's reduced major uh, you know, complications by like 63%. And this is, this is something we're particularly proud of because Medtronic invented the original pacemaker in the 1950s and, and that was an externally one. Now this one is, is miniaturized and deployed with a catheter. Adam, uh, a few moments ago, spoke about the, the, the process of innovation. And right. I'd like you to talk a little bit about how that process works at Medtronic. So where do you get your ideas for, right. for innovations? Um, how, much, how many of them are homegrown? How many of them are sort of through the network? And then what do you do and how do you, what is the process that you follow to bring an innovation through to market? Uh, that's a very good question. So the, the exciting thing about medical technology is, um, is there is relative, there's a lot of technologies that come to play in med tech. And, there's relatively speaking low barriers to entry. So there's a lot, there's a, like he says, there's a guy and a dog right now in Israel inventing something that has some idea that can disrupt the whole cardiac rhythm industry. If they get access to capital, as, as we talked about earlier, and, and they make the right decisions and follow the right development process. So there's, you have to uh, really keep your tentacles out there. And so we, we prefer to organically invent things. Uh, it, 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 uh, it's, it's a much better return on investment. We guarantee the quality of it, but you know that's not possible to because to, there's innovation happening everywhere. So we, you know, we have um, certain areas that we've determined are uh, technical centers of excellence for Medtronic, like uh, microelectronics and and um, uh, robotics now and things of that nature. And and we prefer to to we think we're on the forefront of innovation there. But then there's other areas that um, we're not, and, and that's where we would do more inorganic you investment. You import that, yeah. that and we, innovation. And we tend to buy at early stage, relatively early stage, uh, before commercialization, and then we would um, uh, take it through the, maybe, maybe the clinical trials and then you know, scale it around the world. Uh, so we tend to, we call those tuck-in acquisitions, and we have business development uh, people scouting the globe. But, but really, uh, the, the, the centers of would be you know, Silicon Valley, like West Coast, Minneapolis, uh, and, and the Bay Area. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, you know, Boston area, and then Israel. And Those then, are the big areas. And then the process, you, you go along and you see if it's working. You, you're doing internal testing. Right. Then you may do clinical trials. Exactly. How long does the process take from that initial ideation to the, to the commercial presentation of the product? And has the timeline been shrinking or expanding? Well, if you talk to my boss, it takes too long, mm -hmm. uh, and and we haven't shrunken enough. But it it really the answer to that question, you have to segment the innovation, and we look at innovation in three ways: invention, disruption, and continuous innovation. Now, continuous innovation is very valuable to the healthcare system, but it is a much shorter time frame. So it's like in the pacemaker example, shrinking that pacemaker. Uh, um, you know, improvements to the battery life of that pacemaker. If it's, you know, we have a, a for neuromodulation, uh, we have rechargeable batteries. How fast can you recharge those things? And those incremental investments uh, have really made that those therapies much more ubiquitous. And they are on a cycle of, you know, three years or so. Um, and because you're not fundamentally inventing something new, typically, or or necessarily disrupting. The disruption and it would take the next longest. So, like the mic, the, the small pacemaker was really a disruption, and that that took that maybe took a decade really mm -hmm. to to figure out how to do pacing without any leads. And it might have gone faster, you know, you know, but um, uh, sometimes funding gets stopped in periods of downtime. But Since you and, and invention takes you the longest. So, so you mentioned disruption. What are the disruptive technologies that you've got your eye on right now in your in your realm? Well, I mentioned, I, you know, I look, I meant one is it's miniaturization. Miniaturization is a big one. And, and uh, the computing power um, of putting, you know, uh, computing power like in the device versus in the cloud or something like that, I think that, that, that's happening. And that will allow for a lot of innovation. I tell you what, another disruption, let me, th there's technical disruption. Let me give one example how technical disruption and clinical disruption come, come together. <clears throat> So one is um, the advancements of microelectronics and batteries. We're now putting devices in people that have latent technologies, because of the computing power, uh, have latent technologies that we don't have to turn on right away. They're not needed for the therapy that the patient ha has been prescribed. 
and that through um, uh, you know, uh, tele, you know, communications, wireless communications, we can turn those, those features on later once the FDA, once we've evolved the therapy and the FDA approves it, we can like, turn those on so a patient doesn't have to get a new device. Today, if you want a new therapy, you need a new device, and, and, and that's a new operation and all that. So tomorrow, we'll be able to, through firmware and software, turn an existing device into a new therapy. Now, taking, now that's the technology side. On the clinical side, You'll have uh, patients now, let's say we have a hypothesis of a new uh, spinal cord stimulator, right? That we have a new pulse, uh, pulse width or a new energy pattern that we think will better alleviate back pain. We have this hypothesis, we'd like to test it. The FDA gives us approval within certain parameters to test it. A patient has one of these devices in already. In the old days, we have to have a custom device for to try that out. Today we can, um, if the patient volunteers, we can, uh, through software, change the therapy on that device, test it out, and, and, um, and, and learn very fast, and learn a lot faster. And then ultimately, once the FDA approves it, we can, like I said, we can download the whole new therapy. So, because the batteries are lasting longer, so this device, instead of lasting three years, it now lasts, you know, 15 or 12 years, depending on the battery, and we can have multiple new therapies on that same device. And that, that, is, that is the safety profile, the efficacy, that will dramatically uh, change healthcare. You've mentioned FDA approval a couple of times in the context yeah. of your answers, and with, without taking you down a path that you may not want to go, I, I feel I have to ask you, do you detect a difference in the speed with which the current FDA, uh, under the Trump administration, processes innovation and advancements versus prior administrations? Is it faster? Is it, is it different? What changes do you notice? You know, I, I can't say versus the Trump administration versus prior administrations because we have seen, luckily, some continuity of the leadership of the device sector of the FDA. And, and as, as different, you know, uh, from Obama to Trump, they, they kept the same, some of the same leadership one layer below mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. the FDA commissioner. And that continuity has been important. And uh, we find them to, to be more partnering with us and faster. They're, they're, they want to work with us. Look, there's a lot of, they have a lot of press they need to deal with and perceptions. But I find them to want to partner and want to help us get devices uh, to patients appropriately and with speed. And so we're, we are working together on that. And uh, with they, they still prioritize safety first, but they are trying to get things faster. And I've seen them uh, really... Um, be more transparent with us, and, and we have to be more transparent with them, and we make mistakes. We've got to tell them quickly and, and be transparent, but I, I think it's moving faster. I like where we're going. Um, but it's key is at the continuity of some of these uh, administrators. You mentioned earlier that you like, uh, ideally, uh, to develop your ideas organically, mm -hmm. internally, but that sometimes you go out and do an acquisition mm -hmm. because that company may have an advantage that you can incorporate. Mm -hmm. As you, and that's a big part, I'm sure, of what right. you do is evaluating uh, uh, which companies uh, might be worth an investment or an right. acquisition. Uh, as you do that, without sort of opening your playbook for everybody in the room, are there areas or companies that you see today that you would say that, that, that you think others may be overlooking? Sure. I mean, look, I mentioned, you know, there's the traditional med tech M&A formula I think many people here are familiar with, collaborating with physicians all over the world and, 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 and incubators and all that good stuff. That's still out there, and there's a lot of innovation right now, um, given all these technology trends, so that's great. But one area that I'm finding uh, people are overlooking right now uh, is China uh, for real organic innovation. So right now the, the dialogue on China is about trade disputes, and for innovators, everybody's worried about um, kind of IP infringement, and, and we, we can't launch our latest and greatest technology in China because they'll copy it and take our IP, and that's what everybody's focused on, the negatives. But underneath that, I'm seeing real technol organic technology advancement, scientific advancement in, in, in China, and they are moving fast. And, um, and you have to figure out a way I think, uh, to partner with some of these entrepreneurs and some of these uh, uh, researchers and, and universities in China. And ultimately, can we do that uh, BD playbook in China? It's much more complicated, um, but I think we have to figure out a way to 
um, be part of that innovation that's going on in China, whether it's organically and local, localizing our innovation capabilities in combination with maybe some M&A. We've put Medtronic's got an own uh, venture capital fund in there in China, denominated r and What kinds of things are the Chinese working on that, that lead you to, to conclude that, that, that they're, they're making really big strides oh. that would have been impossible 15 years same, ago? Same, well, I mean, they're, it's they're, the same kind of same things. kind of things. I mean, they just have talent. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think people are overlooking that talent. And there's the old playing the old tapes of, well, they're just going to copy. Uh, and I, I, see, I see them moving fast. And then there's competitors, even the analysts that follow our space, they ask me about the, the household names that, that we compete with. No one even, they don't even know the names of these, these Chinese competitors. That, that, that Those Chinese competitors are the ones that I've got my eye on because they are moving fast. They've got capabilities. They've got the government behind them. There's favorable government policy. Um, so, you know, don't get distracted on the negative uh, narrative on China. You pay attention to also the innovation that's, that's happening. That's very now. interesting. Uh, you mentioned a couple of things that, that you've got your eye on. Is there a next big thing that is on your radar? Uh, I say one next big thing is, um, look, the brain, so look, I run the neurosciences business and we have a big cardiac business, a general surgery business and a diabetes business that, you know, that's a $30 billion enterprise in med tech. And my colleagues in cardiology have done such a good job of innovating around cardiac care. I mean, when people pass away, we're gonna have to turn off their heart. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's unbelievable uh, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but it opens up, there's a lot of innovation in, in the neuroscience space. And one that I'm particularly excited about is brain sensing. So we've talked about, you know, stimulating the brain uh, to, uh, to alleviate symptoms like the Parkinson symptoms and, and the central tremor and things like that. But that's like basically, for you non-technical folks who I'm one of, it's like shouting at the brain. We're just sending electrical signals in there and then seeing what happens. That, zzz, what happens? Zzz, what happens? And it's been an empirical approach. Now, within six months, Medtronic's launching a device that has sensing inside. So we're going to listen to the brain. And neuro, neurologists and, and neuroscientists and neurosurgeons are super excited about this for the first time. We're we'll able to start to understand what the brain, how it works. It's a white space. And so we're, we're launching this device that will provide uh, brain modulation therapy, but at the same time listen, and we can do research on what we learn from that. And we'll be launching a, a clinical trial that like, closes the loop that says, OK, we listen to the brain, we stimulate, we see, and then we listen to what how it reacts and the central nervous reacts to that stimulation that we modulate the therapy. So that's, we'll do a trial to figure that out as well. So a lot, lot of uh, advancements in, in, in understanding the brain and the, central, and the rest of the central nervous system are going to happen. I'm very excited about that. Where does artificial intelligence fit in all that you do? Well, I thought some of the prior speakers did a good job articulating it. it it's um, just to build on what they're saying. Look, we're getting data sources now from all types of data sources. So, First of all, our own data sources. We put the little computers inside of people. We were focused on what they did to the body. Now we're also collecting, we're putting different sensors on there and collecting data, which we don't, we're just learning to figure out what to do with that data. We're also collecting data from wearables and you know, apps for what, tracking what people eat. And we're starting to triangulate this um, to you know, isolate locate and isolate the disease progression, connect comorbidities, and ultimately fine tune our therapies, uh, personalized medicine. And we're seeing that, you know, it's real, it's happening. I mean, like in our diabetes business, we partnered with IBM's Watson Technology, and, and we're, it's the first, I think, real, uh, real time, continuous collection device for all types of, of, of data uh, that, you know, what the person's eating, their activity levels, um, their, their glucose to insulin levels, and then we're now, that feeds a personalized sugar level adjustment for these diabetics, which, so that's a, 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 a that's small, amazing. powerful that's amazing. example. Though. So you're going to know when I have that third Oreo cookie. Oh, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the second martini. Yeah, exactly. And I'll know when you get up and how, you know, in, in the middle of the night and everything. So, you know. Yeah. Oh, you don't want to know that. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah. Jeff, thank you so much. Hey, thank you. I hope you sold your GE stock. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Thanks, man.